and it's also for the 8th century monk, the Venerable Bede, the Goths were the earliest and Germanic Catholics. There are an alternative to classical paganism and to Protestantism. Tolkien said that the Gothic language had reached the um, eminence of liturgical use. In other words, it, the, the Lord's Prayer and various um, Gospels were translated, but failed owing to the tragic history of the Goths to become one of the liturgical languages of the West. That was because they adhered to the Arian heresy, which disputed the divinity of Christ. Robert Murray uh, remembered uh, in, August 17, in August 1973 that um, Tolkien, Ronald, uh, Ronald Tolkien, was maintaining with great vigor over the luncheon table that one of the greatest disasters of European history was the fact that the Goths turned Arian. But for that, their language is just ready to become classical would have been enriched not only with a great Bible version, but also on Byzantine principles with a vernacular liturgy, which would have served as a model for all Germanic peoples and would have given them a native Catholicism, in other words, um, a Gothic mass, which would never break apart. And with that, he rose and in splendidly sonorous tones declaimed the Our Father in Gothic, which begins, Atta unza duin himenum hainar namo thine. In 1952, Tolkien had recited uh, this into a tape recorder to cast out any devils that were lurking within. Now, this is one of the very few um, properly Gothic texts that has survived, and it provided Tolkien with some of his um, elvish vocabulary. Atta, meaning father, uh, coincides with the Quenya, the elvish uh, word Attar. Now, the fact that this literary and linguistic tradition um, had been almost completely lost was for Tolkien a tragedy, the tragedy of history. As he wrote shortly after the publication of The Return of the King, I am a Roman Catholic, so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat. Though it contains, and in a legend may contain more clearly and movingly, some examples or glimpses of final victory. The long defeat, that phrase repeats the haunting phrase used by Galadriel. Together, through the ages of the world, we have fought the long defeat. So that phrase binds together the Goths, the dissolution of English Catholicism, and the disenchantment of Middle Earth. But out of this defeat came the Gothic, imagined, created, and realized in Tolkien's own writing as a potential restoration of a renewed English national identity. Thank you. Well, this uh, is quite a mouthful, Nick. I mean, um, you have illuminated us plenty here today, I think. Um, Lots of new notions that I was not aware of that you brought up here today mm -hmm. and that I think would be, you know, very, very interesting to discuss here at large. Uh, Nick has also mentioned, as you've heard, uh, he's given many references to works that we have read in class, that we have seen, ideas on the sublime. We have um, discussed Frankenstein at some length, uh, we looked at Keats and, and, and Burke and all the others, Coleridge. So, um, if you have any questions um, that you want to ask Nick, this is a golden opportunity now. We, have, we still have about five or ten minutes that we can devote to questions. If anyone wants to ask Nick anything, feel free to do so. Okay. Hello, Dr. Groom. Thank you for your presentation today. <clears throat> it's been a pleasure to hear you. Um, I have a question about what you mentioned about uh, the origins of uh, Goths and all the Gothic influence that has been uh, along all the history. Um, I was thinking that you m may suggest a relation between the Gothic and Nazism, maybe? 
the origin of Nazism and all that? Yeah, I think that, that's certainly something that Tolkien himself was very concerned about. Um, while he was, one of the things that Tolkien is trying to do, um, not only in his um, creative work, but also in his critical work, is to um, create an alternative cultural canon, one that's focused very much on ideas of the North, of Northern literature, and of Northern values. Um, and he realised um, that um, the Nazi party were doing something similar in Germany throughout the 1930s, partly by championing the work of Richard uh, Wagner. So although Tolkien, I mean, Tolkien certainly had an interest in Wagner and Wagner was using similar sources, um, he, um, he, he worked to distance himself from, from Wagner. And he famously said, you know, the only thing that I share with Wagner is the fact that we each describe a ring and both rings are round, as, <laughs> as Thomas, Thomas knows. Which is not quite correct. No, it's not correct, no. Correct. He no. took the, the motive from Wagner of this kind of the power of the ring, which, mm. is, not, which is not in the original Nordic, Nordic sagas. And so he, that's why he was very so concerned that the Nazis also misused that. Indeed, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, he does, um, I mean, Wagner also downplays the role of women. Um, and uh, so Tolkien is very interested in the role of, of Guthrie, yeah. for example. But he, he was aware that his work could ra ran the risk of being contaminated by that um, fascist um, ideology. And so that's one of the reasons I think that he's thinking about not only industrial and technological progress in Numenor, for example, but is also thinking about the effect that this has um, on social life and on, and on politics. Now, in terms of how the Nazis used um, those Gothic myths, um, there's a, there is a different tradition in Germany, um, as there's a different tradition in Spain. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting, I think, over the course of the next um, day to think about whether the Spanish inheritance um, of the idea of the Gothic has any similarities um, to what's happened in England and whether the German experience is comparable, comparable or not. I suppose, finally, you could argue that Tolkien does succeed in separating his version of the Gothic and also of Northern identity from the taint of Nazism um, because, you know, look where we are now. Um, and, you know, in, in that sense, you know, we, we don't read Lord of the Rings and think that it's a sort of uh, um, a crypto-Nazi um, novel. Um, you know, he has succeeded in redefining what that relationship uh, would be. And I would suggest that it's, it's, it's through the, the, the Catholic Gothicist um, inheritance that he develops. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Challenging question. Mm. Right. More questions? Anyone else in the audience? No. I'm quite happy to talk um, over the next um, day or so as well if anyone wants to talk, you know, without having to talk in a big hall. Exactly. <laughs> which yeah. can be intimidating. So also tomorrow, we'll, we'll have a, an opportunity with the roundtable session to, to ask questions to Nick and to Thomas as well um, after his plenary talk as well. I was wondering, Nick, um, one of the things that I've um, come to learn throughout the course of this, of this um, talk is that it seems like Tolkien is, is using the Gothic then to denounce progress uh, in a way, but at the same time he is denouncing the Gothic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. Uh, this this um, indulgence in, in the horror and not, an, not taking an active response mm -hmm. against anything, this defeatism in a way, right? So it seems to be contradictory because he says also that you're fighting the long defeat and that's what we do, that's what he does as a, a Roman Catholic, um, conceiving of history as a long defeat. But at the same time, he urges people to fight against it, right? Yeah, so it, it's, it's very much the... Um, the what's sort of considered to be the credo of Northern Courage at the end of yeah. the Battle of Malden. Uh, that Tolkien alludes to um, in his radio play, uh, The Homecoming of Bjortnoth, Bjorthelm's Son, which was actually broadcast, I think, in 1953, just as he was finishing uh, The Lord of the Rings. Um, and that um, is, you know, our, our, our heart, the heart will be sterner, the will um, prouder, uh, the spirit stronger, as our physical strength lessens. And so, you know, you, the idea that you sort of keep fighting even though, mm. you know, de de uh, defeat is, is inevitable. Right. Um, and, I mean, The Lord of the Rings is one of the darkest novels of the 20th century. It is about defeat and loss 
um, and the fact that you know the world is a much lesser place at the end than it is at the beginning. I mean, destroying the ring isn't just about defeating Sauron, it's about um, dissolving Lothlorien and doing away with Rivendell, and all of the magic, all of the fairy, um, all of the enchantment um, goes. Um, so it's what you're prepared to sacrifice in order to um, end up with you know, a better um, and, um, and more stable uh, world. You, yeah, know, exactly. you sometimes have to get rid of everything you love um, to prevent the thing that can't be allowed to happen. Right, and he, and he also hated, and he states this in a letter, that he hated Hitler for his misappropriation of this idea of the northern courage to fight yeah. the long defeat, to fight. Um, that was, um, in his sense, uh, in his way of thinking, Hitler had misappropriated and misapplied this idea of northern courage and make, making it forever accursed, he says yes. in his letters. And making it and triumphalist as well, rather than uh, having that, yes. um, much more... Um, that much sort of darker route. So he wanted to rehabilitate the yeah. notion of the Northern yes. Courage through his work and yes. putting it in a different light. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think it's very interesting to think about that in terms of the posthumous works. Um, you know, the Silmarillion is a very challenging work. It's best if you read the Silmarillion backwards. Um, start, start with the last bit on the Third Age and then read, read, read through it backwards. But in that, in the children of Hur, in, um, in Sigurd and Guthrum and so forth, you can see his um, attitudes changing. Um, I think but also, the, the, is the, what we tend to forget with Tolkien is that he worked on these texts um, in the most part throughout his life. And it was a long life that was lived through epochal events, two world wars, um, for example, the aftermath of the world wars, um, rapidly changing um, society. So it's not like we can say, well, um, you know, they're simply uh, the product of a, a particular year and narrow experience. They actually take in a wealth um, of um, critical um, and creative thinking uh, from across decades and decades. And um, that's why it's so difficult um, to get a, uh, a good text of a work such as a Silmarillion, because he changed his mind um, about it. Um, and he was interested in process uh, rather than necessarily having a definitive um, text. Look at the History of Middle-earth volumes, which are a wonderful resource um, for that. You can see um, how uh, radically um, things do change. Um, and consequently get an insight um, into the structure um, and the possibilities of the text as it was eventually published. Great. So um, any final question, short question before we go on this coffee break? Um, anything that anyone wants to comment on, add, ask about? No? If not, I think this has been a riveting start for the conference, and it's touched upon many of the key issues that we will be debating throughout the conference here, um, especially taking on this diachronic perspective, looking at, at the different stages in the evolution of, of, the, um, of the ideas of nationhood and Gothic and so on and so forth. So now we will be having a short break, and at um, 6.30 we will be back here again um, for, yeah, so there's only about five minutes for this coffee break, I'm afraid. But at 6.30, we'll be starting again with, with uh, the next session with a short film. But I want you to give an, a final applause to Nick and thank him again for coming here. Thank you very much.